So I can remember coming home from practice one time and seeing myself in the mirror in the elevator. And because I had been through such a tumult in the last, the previous four years, it was like a complete relief to see my own reflection. Cause I was like, Oh yes, I know that guy. Like I, I can see that I'm still here and that I exist. Welcome to the Funny and Failure podcast, a podcast that celebrates failure and shines the light on the emotional side of comedy with yours truly, Michael Kahan. Today's guest is one of the most well-rounded individuals I've ever met. He's a great conversationalist with amazing insights and astonishing self-awareness. His unique philosophies and forward-moving approach is simply mind-blowing. I really appreciate Paul's humor ability to laugh at himself and learn from his experiences. So let's talk about Paul. Paul Shirley is a former professional basketball player who played for 17 teams in a nine-year career, including stints in the NBA with teams such as the Phoenix Suns, Atlanta Hawks, and the Chicago Bulls. He's also a writer, speaker, and author of four books. His work has appeared in places such as Esquire, The Wall Street Journal, and Playboy. After Paul's basketball career, he began writing books. It was in this time that he made the connection that defines what we do. It doesn't matter whether it's basketball or writing or entrepreneurship. Accomplishing big goals happens because we build a process. His first book, Can I Keep My Jersey, is a great read with a unique tone and humor. And regardless of whether you like basketball, I really recommend it and you can see why in this conversation. His second book, Stories I Tell on Dates, came out in 2017. The Chicago Tribune said it resonates with anyone who favors introspection and emotional honesty. The book also became a podcast that is better than most podcasts, according to Paul. And his third book and first novel is Ball Boy. And I'm about to read a blurb from his fourth book, The Process is the Product. These are the lessons Paul Shirley has learned. It doesn't matter if it's professional sports, writing, public speaking, engineering, or acting. There will never be enough money, fame, or success to justify all the work if you can't enjoy the work itself. You have to fall in love with the process. In The Process is the Product, Paul shares stories of failure and rebirth that have taught him this lesson with one goal in mind, helping you fall in love with your process so that you can find meaning, finish projects, and accomplish the goals you set for yourself. He also runs The Process, a professional hub to help artists, entrepreneurs, and the like. Their motto is, we help people do focused work so they can accomplish big goals. The link for this is in the episode notes below if you'd like to get involved. So it's always really interesting that when you hear the word athlete or ex-NBA player, you think of a person in a certain way. That is the bright lights, the fame, unlimited cash flow. However, Paul explains that this applies only to a fraction of the world and how it's really challenging both mentally and physically to maintain a career in this field. So for example, we dive into excessive travels, lack of certainty, physical and mental health, development, creative flow, identity, creativity and entrepreneurship, building a process and how this has all led him to writing. Before we get into this chat, in case you aren't aware, the videos are now available on YouTube under Michael Kahan. That's Kahan with a K, unless you're listening to it already. I find it adds a new element and dynamic to these chats. I'll still be posting snippets of these chats on Instagram under Funny and Failure. So check them out if you want to stay in the loop for upcoming episodes or you want to ask a guest a question. I'd also love it if you would share the podcast or share your takeaways from the chat. It really motivates me helps the podcast grow, and ensures I can lock in amazing guests like this one. And just as a final reminder, the podcast comes out every Monday at 5pm Australian Eastern Standard Time with the video to follow the following day. Anyway, sit back, relax, and enjoy today's epic episode. So I know you're from a small town with less than 100,000 people, I believe. 
I'm surprised you never got into stand up comedy because I heard this story where, you know, your mum's a nurse and <laughs> you had to do sex ed classes and your mum was the nurse. Can you please tell me about that experience and why you didn't pursue stand up comedy after something like that? <laughs> it was a, a formative experience. And I will say that I have used that story in situations where I need to, uh, get people on my side. The the history is that uh, I grew up in a town of about 700 people. Oh, 700. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and so everybody kind of knew everybody. And what that meant was that when the home ec, home economics teacher said it was sex ed day, we were actually, nobody was that surprised when in walked my mom, the school nurse to teach sex ed. I was not pleased, especially because I was a shy kid. And I didn't want to be the brunt of any jokes as most kids wouldn't want to, but I especially was aware that people might latch on to my general uh, lack of success with girls at the time and, uh, and use that against me. So sure enough, my mom um, does the usual, puts the slides up for, this is what chlamydia looks like. And, you know, here's what herpes is and you don't want that. And, and uh, additionally, you definitely don't want AIDS, which was starting to be a big thing at the time. And they were using a lot of scare tactics to make sure that nobody ever had any sexual fun in those days. <laughs> and so my mom said, to prevent all of this, I'm going to show you guys how condom works and so my mother in front of my seventh grade class unrolls a condom on a banana and when i would tell this story around my mom she eventually said paul that's not what happened and i was like oh man i must have i must have made this worse in my head right like maybe maybe this didn't happen at all and i And maybe she just like held up a banana and a condom and she goes, no, no. So I didn't use a banana. I just unrolled the condom on my forearm. And I was like, Whoa, that's way worse. (laughs) I actually made it better in my brain over time. Like I, I improved the story for my own sanity. Yeah. Um, So at any rate, when my mom was standing there with the condom on her forearm, one of my classmates goes, too bad her son's never going to get to use one of those. And I, uh, on cue, just burst directly into tears, which I think was made all the worse because my mom was the person leading this because she actually couldn't come to my defense correctly because like then that would just invite more ridicule. Um, But the good thing about that experience, I think, is that I have learned how to be self-deprecating because of experiences like that. Like at the time, if I had just been able to say like, yeah, well, uh, I don't want to deal with any of these trashy white trash girls that I'm, that we're all growing up with. I'm going to do better someday. Like that would have been a great way to like diffuse that, but I didn't have that kind of wit or, um, sarcasm, which I think oddly comes from puberty. Like I had, I was just like a little kid still. And all my friends were like snappy and witty so I feel like I matured into a certain level of cleverness and that probably helped that I'm process. I'm glad that it experienced, you can see the positives from some, something like that. I'm surprised that you just didn't stay a virgin your whole life or could have been funny if your mom called you on stage and said, honey, show them what I taught you at home. And that could have really right. Right. <laughs> Well, it was, this was all particularly uh, difficult to manage because uh, at the time, my parents in this small town had just had my youngest brother, who was very clearly an accident. Like he was much younger than the other three of us. And so like my friends were also able to say like, oh, yeah, it's too bad your mom doesn't know how to practice what she preaches, which meant that this extended beyond just that day. Oh, that's hard because you don't want to visualize that. You don't want to go near that. And that's like yeah, a double. you don't want to be. Yeah, that was that was a tough uh, tough year of school. So, so it's did it help with your shyness? Because you said you developed humor and all of that. How did you transform and evolve? And I'm probably like jumping ahead, but you have to be pretty confident to be an athlete. So to go from mm. being a very shy kid, have an experience like that, which can crush you for a long time. Tell me your <laughs> secrets. 
I, yeah, it's, I, um, as I look back at those days, I don't know that I was actually as shy as I would make things out to be. It's more that I didn't understand, um, people, <laughs> which makes me sound kind of autistic, <laughs> which is maybe true. Um, but I, uh, I was kind of oftentimes like bored by people, but at the same time confused by the way that they acted. And I think that helped me um, pour my efforts into basketball because basketball felt like a way out. It also was a place where things made sense, right? Like the world was pretty clear on the court. If you made the basket, then you got to keep playing. And there was a, a real meritocracy to it. And it was something that I could understand. I think because I was a late developer in a maturation way, I didn't necessarily understand the ways of social encounters very well. So I was, it wasn't that I was actually that like reticent. It was more just like, I didn't, I just didn't know what was going on. Cause like, I was very happy being a little kid. I was a happy little boy. And then everybody starts going through puberty and I was like, not doing it yet because I was still growing. And um, I think basketball worked as a way to fit in um, without having to be socially adept. Interesting. I know that you're friends with the previous guest, Chris Anstey, and he says something similar, how his words and that he wasn't the most social kid growing up, but basketball really unleashed his, whether it's confidence or ability to deal with people and I know you speak about empathy as well, but that was kind of like his puberty in the sense. I know he started much later, but it helped him interact mm-hmm. in the world. Yeah, yeah. I, and I, I, think, um, I think there are actually a lot of athletes who would have similar experiences. There is the stereotype of the dumb jock that we use here in America, of course. And oftentimes that really only applies to the high school jock. Yep. I think Chris and I would be similar in that we didn't at all hit our peak in, in high school age. We were much later developing. And so in a way, I was like, a, like an art kid almost with sports. And it turned out that a lot of pros were kind of the same way where, you know, there were guys who were really great when they were 14 or 15. But a lot of people, it was a, a slower developing journey. And I, I've always had a lot of commonalities with musicians. I get along with musicians and, and like you're saying with stand-up comedians, I think those are uh, populations where they felt misunderstood and they were able to kind of put all their efforts or, or put their uh, enthusiasm in this thing that made them feel okay and made them feel accepted. I will say too, that much like with comedy or public speaking or, or music, uh, when I was on the court, I felt a sense of peace and like I could really be myself. Wow. Um, that was uh, not as accessible off the court. And that was also really addicting, right? Like, oh, this, I'm safe out here, you know, between these lines. I can be more like who I want to be. Uh, and I'm not as uh, confined by whatever people think I should be. Oh, okay. Already, I think I wrote 10 points, which is going to be exciting. You, it's very interesting because it sounds like it was like a safe haven, safe haven for you where you can kind of block out the noise. And in this day and age, and I know it was a little while ago, there's a lot of noise, external chitter chatter, people speaking, and it can be very hard to deal with, especially as a kid. So I'm just wondering, did that kind of like, it sounds like that was your meditation. I think you also meditate now, but that was your meditation so that you can be yourself. Is that how you were seeing it at the time? I don't know if I would have been able to articulate it, but I felt that way. Mm. Uh, And what I particularly loved about basketball was that you could do it on your own, right? So even if um, you didn't have, like I, as I mentioned, I have three younger brothers. They may not have always wanted to play, right? But I could go out on the court in the, and when I say court, I use that term loosely. It was, our gravel driveway and a basket hanging off the deck, right? Uh, which probably taught me a lot of ball handling skills. I was actually a point guard in these days. <laughs> so like dribbling the ball and not knowing if it was going to bounce this way or that way <laughs> probably helped my hand-eye coordination. That's pretty but good. But uh, I think um, 
that sense that like, well, I can always access this feeling of just being outside and shooting. And I don't, I don't need someone else to, um, help with this. Unlike uh, baseball, like we grew up playing a lot of baseball, but that involved, you know, a whole team and you couldn't just dial it up whenever you wanted. So it did feel really meditative to me. And I think that's what I, I love that sense of peace, but I also loved the sense that I had found something that I just got better much more quickly than other people. There was just that feeling of like, there's something about this game that I understand so much better than other people that I think is really addicting, especially when you're young in the same way that I'm sure like playing the guitar would, would work that way. I, I took piano lessons as a kid and never had that feeling with piano, right? Like it was, it was always clunky and always a sense that, well, I can get better, but it's a very linear kind of improvement. Whereas with, with baseball, for example, it was a slightly exponential increase, but with basketball, it was a very exponential increase in my ability to understand how the game worked. That's very interesting. Regardless, whenever we try something, it's always a slow build. Obviously, you excel quicker in basketball, but no one just picks up something and becomes good. And you mentioned that mm. when you're playing basketball, you know, you're starting at the very bottom, but you're building up. And I think that's really interesting to hear, especially from someone who's accomplished so much in the basketball world that you need, like it takes time and effort. We don't just become mm. that NBA player. You mentioned there's like the one kid who's 14 and excels, but like not even like Michael Jordan or Kobe Bryant, who I know you don't love Kobe Bryant, which we'll maybe get into. It's just, it's rare. And one of the many takeaways I got from your book was you kind of shined a light on how, what well, not the best player does, but someone who's really good and the hustle and the traveling and how you're not always on the team and earning millions of dollars. Life doesn't work out like that. We just focus on the one to like five best players on a team but we don't see the whole journey of how someone gets into the NBA or in other amazing teams as well, which I found really interesting. It's also worth mentioning. I talk a lot about building habits and routines and, and processes. I think more or less anyone could build a process to accomplish uh, nearly anything, but within reason, there's a multiplier there. You have to, you have to build systems, but you also have to have some just innate skill for it. And I think it's a test for all of us to find some of the things that we have some innate skill for, and then multiplying those with the habits and routines that we uh, have embraced. So, you know, you, we talk, you know, Chris and Steve, of course, he was a great tennis player. So that's one of the things that he was really good at. Um, and, basketball worked that way too. If it's me, um, I've, when I was younger, I played a fair bit of golf, right? Tried it out, would, you know, try to come up with routines for it. But there was that sense that like, I'm never going to be great at this. And I think that's, you know, in certain circumstances, that's okay. Uh, yep. That's not, you know, that's not something I'm going to pursue with my full passion. Um, there's a really cool book called, I don't think it's, I don't think I have it here, but it's called range. And it's about how generalists usually went out. There's a, um, speaking of tennis, really good reference in there to Roger Federer and how he was actually pretty late in coming to tennis. We mythologize like the young prodigy, but most of the time, most people take a long time to figure out what they're really good at. And I think that's one of the things that's scary about making kids specialize really early is that they're not given the opportunity to try all of these different things, right? So, you know, yes, I am probably most known for being a professional basketball player, but I also loved spelling, right? I was a spelling bee wonder. I loved spelling bees. I loved practice spelling. There was something about spelling where I could just like visualize it. I ended up in eighth grade finishing fifth in the Kansas state spelling bee out of, wow. you know, 105 different counties. So I had won the school spelling bee, the county spelling bee and gotten to that far. So, but like, there's no money in spelling. There's no college scholarship for spelling. So at some point it just petered out. Right. So in my brain, I don't necessarily think of myself as a better basketball player than I was a speller. I was kind of in a similar level. It's just that there's nowhere to go with spelling. 
uh, the point of that, I guess, is just that like, it's, there's just, there are certain things that kids are going to have resonate with them. And as weird as it was for me, it, spelling was one of those things. Now you wouldn't know that if I didn't tell you, there's no, there's no like plaque at the school for my spelling. I'm surprised prowess. you carry trophies or carry it around. Yeah. On dates. And like, and who, know, who cares if I was good at spelling, but, I, but it's, there's value, I think in finding those things that, that hit your receptors um, because it's so empowering for a child to feel that sense of I'm good at things and I can make progress in it. And the danger is if you don't expose kids to a bunch of different things, they won't ever find any of those. That's very interesting. I'm also surprised that you didn't have luck with ladies when you're the spelling bee champion. <laughs> you, guys, you guys want to see my $25 gift certificate to the mall? For well, I actually, thing? I think I heard elsewhere that you are a coloring champion as well. This man's multi-talented. <laughs> He's a writer, professional athlete. He can draw and, and he can spell. I hope that's on your Tinder bio as well. Yeah, right. I'll put that, put that back in Twitter. <laughs> it's, it's very interesting because we talk about um, – maybe the right word is positive delusion on this podcast. And just prefacing that, we also talk about how people hit success later in life. Obviously, as a basketball player, we think that you're just the star at 18 and that's not really the case. I've had so many actors who have got fame, inverted commas, whatever that means, but let's just call it success in their 30s, their 40s. Had a stand-up comedian who was a CEO of a tech company who started to stand up in his 50s. And life is not, you're not just a superstar at 18. And you mentioned, well, actually, we'll talk about positive delusion because some people think they're amazing at something, but they're not actually that good. Or some people feel they're good at something. No one else can see it, but they build at it, they chip at it away, and they know inside that they're actually good. Did you know when you were doing basketball that was the feedback that you're going to be an NBA player? What was like going on in your mind? Mm, I... I would say that it is difficult to retrospectively analyze because it is tempting for me to say, yes, I always thought I would play in the NBA. I, I think I was aware that, as I mentioned, I had some faculty for this that was very different from what other people had. Um, and I think, would say that I believed I would play professional basketball, but I could have also been delusional if things hadn't gone the right way. You know, I had to, like, I would, I would say that as a 15 year old, I would have thought I will play in the NBA, even if I don't grow to be six foot nine or 207 centimeters tall. Right. Um, now, is that realistic? I don't know. But I, but I believed so strongly that maybe it was. I, it's hard to say, right? Yeah. I think you, you have to combine some level of delusion with, again, this skill set, with, again, the capacity for building the habits that'll get you there. Um, I was not at all highly recruited. So here in the U.S., right, we are really beholden to a high school, to college, to the pros, um, trajectory for the most part. And I struggled to find even a college to play in because I was from such a small town. I was averaging a zillion points, but it was against what people perceived as um, subpar competition. I would play in the summers, but for some reason, because I wasn't, we didn't know the right places to go. I wasn't like in the recruiting hotbeds. Yeah. So I ended up going to Iowa State University um, on an academic scholarship, actually. So I had done really well on a test in high school, and that meant that I was a national merit scholar, which is a pretty big deal uh, at the time. And that meant that uh, I could go to some colleges for free. And so we found out that this was true at Iowa State. We had some contacts there where they were interested in me, but they didn't have a, a basketball scholarship for me. So the only reason I got to go play at such a high level was actually because of my academics. I went there with the deal that I would that no one would know that I was on an academic scholarship because I felt like it would probably work against me with my teammates, which I think was likely true. How so? Um, they perceive you as in what way? 
Yeah, because so technically, again, this is, I mean, I'm over explaining and we're a little in the weeds, but in, in college sports here in the U.S., there are walk-ons on the team. Those are guys who are not on athletic scholarship and are there basically to be sort of cannon fodder during practice. So technically I was a walk-on, but I didn't want to be associated with that kind of end of bench mentality. Um, so my only caveat to Tim Floyd, who was the coach at the time, uh, was no one can ever know I'm a walk-on, which worked out pretty well. There's actually a, a fairly famous um, other walk-on who went to Iowa State named Jeff Hornacek. Oh, okay. <laughs> wow. He was, right. he was a walk-on at Iowa State also. It's, I'm still like hopping on on this point because I think it's – yes, you're obviously very talented, but there's a whole journey there and there's struggles – you probably don't know how you're going to get there. And I think it was actually your mom that found out that you could be a walk on and who knows what would have happened if you hadn't gone through that path. But, you know, you're still excelling as an athlete, but it's still very hard. And obviously you've got talent. And just also mm. on that with, for example, the NBA, we're talking about how you're like, you're the 18 year old and you're the star and you start, that's what we see in the NBA, but reading your book and also hearing you in other podcasts is that you felt like you could have, it was much later, maybe in your 20s or maybe early 30s, correct me if I'm wrong, where you felt that if you're in the NBA system and you, know, you were lucky and you stayed on a team for a while, you could have actually been like an eighth or ninth man. But that's much later on. And I just find that so interesting because, yes, you're shining the light on what the life is as a professional athlete, but also to someone like me who's obviously not going to be a professional athlete, but it shows that you don't need to be the star or the best player in the world at 20 or 18. That you actually do get better if you put in work and you talk about your process as well. I think that's just really interesting. The, which part? The part where I'm realizing what my actual capacity was? Yes. That. Okay. Yeah, I, well, I think that um, you mentioned the sort of delusion aspect to this. Um, most athletes again because it's such a meritocracy are hyper aware of their standing now there are some people who cannot figure that out and they usually wash out because they're not very fun to be around and they're not very helpful for the team to win um i i would say that like i could tell so for us for me going from high school to college the level i played at in college was a much bigger jump than college to the NBA. Oh. Because think about it, like I went from small town high school to what is called here the Big 12 League, which is a league that has Kansas and Texas and like very big schools. And so we were playing and I was playing in, in practice every day with guys who were going to be in the NBA. So my teammates at Iowa State included Marcus Pfizer, who I think was the number five pick in the NBA draft, and Jamal Tinsley, who was a number 18 pick, and Kelvin Cato, who was also a, a like not quite lottery pick, but really high. And then a bunch of guys who were going to go play overseas. Um, so once I was able to at least hold my own at that level, it started to become clear, like, well, there's not that many guys like me who understand basketball and can like handle it on this level. So if I can, if I can do it here, the chances are pretty good. I can do it from here. And I also was starting to figure out like, as, as we're discussing, right? Like, I'm not going to, I grew up idolizing Larry Bird, like every other white kid who grows up in a small town. Right. And so I was starting to put together like, well, I just don't, I don't quite have the capacity that Marcus Pfizer has. Right. Like he probably averaged, I don't know how many points a game in college, but 16 or 17. And I was averaging eight to 10. Right. I wasn't a, like a natural scorer like his, he was, but I brought other things to the table. And so I was figuring out like, well, yeah, I'm, fast. I can, I'm athletic. I can do well. I, I'm strong. Um, so probably as long as I don't get really hurt or as long as I don't piss anyone off, I should be able to make some progress. So that's, and that's, again, that's what sports is so good at is giving you this constant feedback of where you actually stand. I went off to a camp. I think it was my, maybe after my 
junior year of college um, in California with a bunch of other guys who the Portland Trailblazers, I think, were kind of paying attention to. And, you know, you get there and I was I had a certain amount of inferiority complex coming from a small town. But now I've played at Iowa State and we had gone really far in the NCAA tournament the year before. So I was putting together that I can play with these people. And then similarly, after my college career was done, I was not drafted, but went to the NBA Summer League with the Cleveland Cavaliers and can remember pretty clearly the expressions of awe on the faces of the assistant coaches when they saw me play and they realized, oh, this kid we've never heard of is better than we realized. So it's that paying attention, right? Paying attention to the feedback loop of if if they were rolling their eyes at stuff I had done, then I would have to, you know, rethink this and go get an MBA or something. But there was enough feedback along the way because again it's the way that sports works where I had this impression and so similarly I can say without question that like when I played for the Chicago Bulls I got hurt very quickly had my kidney and spleen ruptured and at the time the Bulls were bad and they needed somebody to play hard and so if that hadn't happened and a couple of other things break differently like you would, it wouldn't be surprising if I had played in the NBA for seven years as a kind of like Jeff Foster type. Um, but it, it, that's not the way it went and I'm probably better off for it. Oh, tell me about that. Probably better off or definitely are better off. What's your take on that? Well, I, I, like I was, I was talking to somebody today, this friend of mine uh, named Jennifer say, who was a, um, I really like her book called Chalked Up, which is, she was a, an Olympic level gymnast. She was a national champion in 1986. And we were discussing like how damaging it can be to be really successful early on because then you don't go do other things, right? So if I had made $40 million in my NBA career, um, then I don't know that I would have been motivated to move on to the next thing. And I don't know that that would have kept me happy interesting and you may have not done now like talk yeah i don't know i mean i think like you can you could i think you could make that if i like i have a friend who sold a company a few years ago and i don't know that he needs to work all that hard but he's old enough now where he understands that the work is the point so it's not like he just sits at home now he's the ceo of a different company and he works his ass off at that um and i think as we age we start to realize like there's that we're always going to be interested in pursuing the next thing but if you make that money when you're 28 it's a lot you haven't necessarily learned that lesson yet oh that's a very interesting take because you know you just from the acting space you see like the child star like earn the millions of dollars and then they burn out or we typically focus on the minute stories of where they're doing like drugs and partying and all of that but it doesn't lead to longevity So what I'm hearing as well, because you talk about plans and how it's important to have a plan, but to not be so rigid because you don't know what's going to happen. And I I think you'd be surprised if you were told 20 years ago or whatever, that you would be a writer, an author, a journalist as well, that you would have an amazing writer's block, for example. And, And I'm sure you're very grateful that you've gone into that space because writing is also very healing. You learn a lot about yourself. You meet amazing people. I'm just skimming it because I do screenwriting. And Mm. to me, it's the greatest thing ever. So maybe you wouldn't have gone through that avenue if you were earning the $40 million and who knows what your life would have been. Do you reflect on that? Like if I hadn't, if I hadn't, uh, my first uh, training camp was with the Lakers out of college, right? This is the Lakers of, Shaquille O'Neal and Kobe Bryant and Phil Jackson. And I got cut pretty immediately, but there is also a world where Phil Jackson could have taken a shine to me because I understood the triangle better than some of the morons that he was dealing with. Isn't it pretty basic? Uh, Sorry for cutting off. So basically, yeah, (laughs) it's so I I got there thinking this offense is going to be so complex. I better, (laughs) and it would, they'd make three passes and then the, the triangle quote unquote would be finished. And I'd, was like are you serious this is it there was a guy there who i won't name who even though it was uh, simpler than anything i could possibly imagine just couldn't grasp it and he was on like a half guarantee and i thought well there's a chance that because i can understand this you know 
IQ 80 level offense that maybe I'll get to stick around. Yeah. Um, that didn't happen, but you know, there, again, there's that world where if they take a shine to me in that moment, then uh, things would change and I wouldn't have gone off to Greece to play, which is what happened. And when I got to Greece, I started writing the journal entries that would later become my first book, largely because it was so weird in Greece, there was a lot more hardship than if I had been in the NBA. There's not actually that many interesting stories about the interior of the NBA because it's so antiseptic. Whereas when I was playing in Greece and my first game ever was in Israel and I was remarking about how like they had put I think like a temporary advertisement on the on the floor of the basketball court and it was made of paper and it was like tearing up in the middle of the game you know how like those European games they'll put like a a fresh advertisement for TV down on like the the key or on the baselines I thought it was like the camera work because in the AFL they do uh, our football they have um like a camera which just shows the sponsors. So it's not actually there. Yeah. It's, uh, it's well, you got to remember this is like, this is like 20 years ago. So yeah, they haven't gotten true. to that level yet. Uh, so I, and like that, that stuff I found just like fascinating or, you know, we're getting on the bus in Israel. This, this is all like the first weekend we're getting on the bus in Israel and then on come all of the dudes from the Israeli army with their M16s. And I'm like, what is happening? Right? Like I'm 23. I've never been to Europe before. So that just gave me a, a lot of material in the, the coming years. The fact that I was such a journeyman meant that I had a lot of uh, failures and failures, as you know, as a writer, make for better stories. So I, my, I don't think I would have become a writer if it had just been easy breezy. Hey, this guy's the 11th or 10th man on the Lakers, right? Like that's not, there's no story there. It's just, okay, things are fine. There's no, there's no arc to that. Interesting. And I know you're all about the journey and the process. I'm interested to hear your take on failures because what is your take? So you've had an amazing career. You've 17 teams in nine years, you would have learned a lot and that would have forced you to really redefine how you operate as a player, but also mentally dealing with the loneliness, the hustle. You're probably being cut or changing teams and not dealing with the money. Uh, Sorry, you might not have a stable paycheck. Is that a failure to you, not getting on the team or is doing all of that the failure? What are you, it, it, to me, it's so tricky because it's such a loaded word. How do you view it in that scenario? Yeah, I, I think um, you're right that failure has become uh, almost commoditized in the zeitgeist, right? It, it's, I used to like to talk about the term failure and I still do. Um, it's just that it, I think it has been like so glommed onto in kind of the self-help world that it's become annoying. But I, I, I think if we, if we stop for a second and, and break it down, the great thing that sports teaches you is to fail over and over and iterate, right? So it's, it's one thing to fail. It's a, the next to then pick yourself up and move on. So what is that actually called? That's iteration especially if you talk in startup world, but that's also true in writing or in dating or in even in conversation, right? Like, Oh man, that conversation didn't go great with my girlfriend, mom, whatever it might be. Uh, let me rethink how I approached that and try something new the next time. So that's the very definition of, of iteration, but iteration is not possible without the, the failure. Um, I I'm also I guess my nerdy side is tends to think of failure differently because my degree is in engineering and in engineering, you talk about like structural failure in a much more mm, objective way. It's not like a character flaw. If this piece of metal fails, it's just that, that you put too much weight on or it wasn't strong enough. And so I also tend to think of failure in a fairly, um, non-judgmental way. Now, with that said, of course, when I was in the midst of it, yeah, of course, I was I was very emotional about getting cut by the Lakers or the Greek team not paying me on time, or getting cut again the next year by the Atlanta Hawks, or getting smashed in the face while playing for an exhibition team at the University of Louisville and getting stitched up in the locker room. Like those didn't feel good in the moment, and I certainly 
wasn't able to distance myself and say like, oh, well, that was, you know, just an iteration or an iterative opportunity. Um, but when you are able to step back and realize that in sports, a missed shot is also a failure, but that doesn't mean it was the wrong thing to do, right? Like you, maybe you were supposed to take the shot at that time and it just happens to be that you were slightly off balance. So now should we attach a ton of judgment to that? No, but if you miss 12 of them, should we? Yeah, maybe. Uh, so it's, it's figuring out like how to evaluate those uh, failures and then do something with the information. I like that you say judgment or non-judgment because that is everyone's got that chitter chatter in their head about you suck or you can do better. But also just in basketball, for example, most very few people shoot over 50%. And in like academic world, that's pretty bad if you're getting 50% or winning. Mm -hmm. Like the best teams are above 50%, obviously, but not by that much, depending on the league and all the other structures. Mm So you want to look at failure like that. It just doesn't make sense. But just hearing you and reading your book and uh, researching about you, just the stories, how it led you to writing, the self-awareness that you've gained and the process that, because you've applied what sounds like a similar process to becoming a better basketball player to writing and the mindset behind that, the people that you've met, the opportunities. So do you, this is a bit loaded. Do you view your career as a failure or any elements is it, or is it with time and reflection, you're able to see generally a positive or a learning experience from it? It, it seems entirely positive. Uh, And I don't know that I would, really want it to have gone any other way. I think there are, when I get caught up in ego, occasionally I will get spun out because it's difficult for me to be an objective chronicler of my own basketball skills, right? So if I tell you like, Hey, I was pretty good at this. Like you have obviously researched me, you know, about my basketball past, but most of the people in my life now have never seen me play. And there's not a lot of evidence of me playing. Cause a lot of the, my best like efforts happened in Spain or in Greece or in Russia where the, you know, there's just not a lot of that to be seen, nor would people be particularly interested. So I have to rely on like, Oh man, you know, me playing in Spain was kind of amazing. I mean, it's the second best basketball league in the world. And I was really good there. And I have to just be okay with that without trying to impress upon people. Hey guys, it's really hard to play in Spain, actually. Like, <laughs> uh, pay attention. I was pretty good. So, but, but I think when my, when my ego gets involved, I, or when I'm, or when somebody maybe insults me and I want to stick up for myself and say like, look, I can be objective about how good I was at basketball. But part of my confidence around that objectivity is understanding that I was really good at basketball. Interesting. Right. Like I have, I am, I am okay at taking shots at myself in large part because I know I was very good at this thing. Uh, So that's how you develop it. Cause I detected, well, you say it a lot in the book, but I found that actually quite empowering because you're not actually, attacking yourself and making you feel bad. You understand that you're actually good. I -hmm. want to know kind of the relationship with confidence in sport, because in America, for example, it's very different to Australia where some Americans or sports people, they're like, I'm the best. I'm the hero. I'm God's gift to this planet. Whereas typically Australians, there's a middle ground. They're very Mm -hmm. inverted inverted commas humble. And they don't say that out loud, but you still need to be, from my understanding of speaking to many athletes over the years, you still need to be extremely confident to excel because mental is probably most of it or half of it, or I'd like to know your take. So when you're being cut or you're moving around and things aren't always going well, did you have a lot of dip in confidence? Like how did you stay centered to say to yourself, I'm actually really good at basketball? I think some of it was not talking about it um, in that it, it there is a, I'm noticing about my life currently that what we're doing at the business I run is really empowering and really impactful. And I think is going to be really successful in the long run. Nice. 
but we're still figuring it out. And so I don't go around telling people like this thing I'm doing is amazing (laughs) because that almost invites criticism that I don't know that we can handle right now. And I think that would have been true in some of my early days of being a professional athlete, especially in that when I went off to Iowa state, right. If we back up to me going to high school at that point, Iowa state had sort of committed to this guy's going to be around for four years and they had sort of anointed me as like, he's good enough to come to Iowa state. That wasn't true in the pros, at least from my, in my existence, because I hadn't been drafted. I was just forever having to like find my way onto teams. So I think I was less likely to be really demonstrative or really public about how good I thought I was and was more of a hermit. I would just, you know, when I would came home from Greece, I lived in my parents' basement that summer and I went up to the old high school where I had grown up to work out. I had some inkling that, you know, I was going to make it as a pro, but I wasn't all that confident in that. So I, in a ways, in a way I kind of turtled down, right. I, I like stepped away from any kind of public declaration of how good I was or wasn't because it was so fragile. I think when you're in those early phases, you, you have to think of it like this, like little fragile puppy that's eventually going to become like a full grown dog. But right now we got to protect that thing. That's how I've been taught actually with like screenwriting, for example, I've had so many ideas. I've written heaps of scripts, but at the very start, when you're sharing an idea at its infancy state, you open yourself up to so much feedback. It might not be negative, but it might be just the wrong feedback. Well, for me, I'll just speak about Mm -hmm. me. And it actually derailed me because I didn't know what I had. I needed to work with it. I needed to like play with it before. Then I could go out and get the feedback. But if I was going around everyone and have a look at this, this idea, it stuffed me up and that, that's on me, but I just wasn't ready to be shared. I needed to play with it. Totally. Yeah. That's certainly what I've learned about writing is taking care when asking people for feedback and understanding what you're actually looking for. And that's one thing I almost try to counsel people on when they will ask me to read something of theirs is now, are you looking for a pat on the back here? Are you looking for an actual critique? Are you looking for a leaning positive critique? Are you looking for a harsh critique? Because as you are, as you write, you have to start to articulate that to your editors or, or the people who give you feedback. I, I think I read this somewhere where with writing, you need to have five readers and they need to run the gamut from like one person, you know, is going to be the harshest. One person is just going to say you're a genius and then kind of everywhere in between. And you, you need to go into it knowing that like, if you send it to the five people who are just going to be hard on it, then you, you're, you're going to struggle to get up the next day and keep writing. And on the other end, right? If you just send it to five people who are going to tell you you're the smartest writer ever, you're not going to get any better. <laughs> exactly. But that's tricky, especially with writing. And mm-hmm. I know you've done heaps of writing over your, your life. It can still be hard because you're sharing an emotional aspect of yourself. There's a tone and especially in the books that you've written, it's you. Have you, yeah. and also feedback from a basketball sense is probably a lot more clear. You need to work on rebounding. You need to work on shooting. Was receiving feedback hard for you? And was it different between basketball and writing? I think it's more, uh, more similar than dissimilar in that um, the more you tie your identity to the thing, the harder it is to accept the feedback. Definitely. And when I was a younger player, all, all of my identity was tied up in basketball. So any sort of criticism would throw me off when I was a younger writer, it was the same thing. Now I can look at most writing that I do as um, separate from me, unless I'm in a bad place, right? Like if I'm in a not very good mental space, then I might be more likely to cling to uh, my writing as my only salvation. In the same way that I think about relationships I've been in where if everything else in my life was going poorly, I might get really clingy around that person because they're the only thing giving me some level of uh, nurture or 
uh, positive feedback. And I, and I think it's similar with our like work pursuits and creative pursuits where if things are in balance, you're able to be like, yeah, you know what? You're right. Chapter two should be where the book starts and we can throw away chapter one. But if you're not in the great mental space, you have a hard time letting go of, but I put so much work into it. The artist's journey, and I'm sure you see basketball as also an artist's journey because it can, it can be very creative. We, I'll just give a short example with me. When I left accounting, I had to prove to the world I'm going to be a writer. And I went about everything wrong, but I'm grateful that I went about it that way. I locked myself in a room and I was writing and I thought I was the best writer in the world. I had no writing ability whatsoever. I never learned it. I wasn't even good at English in particular, or just based on that sentence, everyone can tell. But I then showed my script to people. First thing I've ever written. And obviously it's terrible. And someone gave me like bad feedback, bad feedback in inverted commas. And I literally, I was so surprised that I had no ability to deal with it. And I literally just mm -hmm. had a headache. I laid in bed and I just needed to get over it. And that was the greatest experience of my life. I felt so terrible because I realized what you were just saying before about identity and doing other things where you get your self-esteem from and confidence. And that also entails like the daily work that you do on yourself. And we briefly mentioned meditation at the start, but doing all of these things outside of writing actually made me a better writer, made me better able to deal with writing and also took away from the attachment side. So now if someone gives me feedback, I'm confident that I'm a good writer. I know I'm not the best writer. I know that I can improve, but if someone says this is shit, I'll take it on. And if it resonates, I'll play with it, but I'm not going to be so offended and so outraged, but that's not, that's a whole journey in itself. And I know I'm jumping the gun here, but I'm sure that you've had to work on yourself, which I know you have, and you've had to work on daily practices to keep you in a mental space, which would also help the writing as well. Am yeah. I right? Certainly. And I think for me now, writing has also become a way to buoy my day and my mood uh, against the waves and the chaos that is running a business. So I've always felt like it's so helpful for people to have several irons in the fire to go with a cliche, but even, you know, even in college, my, as I mentioned, my degrees in engineering and, and engineering is not easy. Right. Um, but I was also playing high level basketball. And so the two of them together seems like it would be really, really difficult. And it of course was, but they also kind of offset each other. Cause I could say, well, you know, I, I had a bad practice yesterday, but I still have to get up and do this difficult thing that I might get some positive feedback from in that I'm you know, good at this math or whatever we're working with. And vice versa. Like, well, I failed that uh, differential equations test, but at practice, I at least was able to get a few rebounds. And I think our lives work in a similar way where um, it is tempting to think, well, I better devote the entirety of my existence to this one thing. But I think that actually works against us most of the time. Uh, 100%. And the advice I've received on this podcast is just from an acting point of view, a lot of actors typically doesn't mean it's for everyone, but they have to be an actor. Their identity is about being an actor. I'm an actor. I'm going to be the world's greatest actor. But most actors mm. work less than they actually work. So if you've yeah. tied your identity in that, you are screwed. <laughs> it's going to be so hard. And so the mm. advice that most actors seem to have received is that you need to do other things. And that's, I'm not just talking about from a job point of view, whether it's like, you know, you're a waiter or whatever, but actual hobbies and other things that build your self-esteem up and your confidence. Because if you don't have that and you're that one thing, well, you think you're that one thing. And then when you're not playing that role as that one thing, you're in for a tough time. So did you have to develop like hobbies and other things to build up your self-esteem and confidence when things aren't going to the plan? I have, I have learned to do that. When I quit playing, um, I went to therapy for two years pretty solid. I nice. am still a believer in therapy, but this was like a particularly intense time of therapy. And um, we talked a lot about sort of trying to, you remember that scene in like alien where the alien is just like glommed on to somebody's face. That was like basketball with me at this point, right? Where I had fought for a long time to keep myself 
or to make myself a human of multiple interests. But by that time, basketball had kind of consumed me and it was how I derived self-esteem. It's how I thought of myself. I had begun writing at this point, but it was still very much in the context of I'm a basketball player who writes. And so it has been, you know, a real journey these last few years to a few meaning like the last 10 years to really start to learn how to be a full human again. You know, when I was a kid, of course I was a full human. I played baseball. And as I said, I was in the spelling bees and I was a boy scout and I had flirted with girls and whatever else, but then basketball just took over more and more and more and more fully glommed onto my face. So it, it has taken some unwinding because you get so much, positive feedback from being a professional athlete, even at my level, right? It was still like kind of glamorous to people's brains and, you know, they're asking you a lot of questions. I've had to think a lot about like, I got so used to being asked questions and conversations that I really had to focus on, Paul, you got to learn how to like engage as a person, not just as the subject of an interview, you know? With, it's also, I'll just um, pump your tires up a little bit just so people actually know, but you would have been at like any stage in your career, one of the top very few thousand best players in the entire world. And I just think that's important to show because you're obviously very talented and the NBA is what well, I have no idea how many people are in a team, but it's probably like 15 now and 30 teams. That's hardly any. And there's a lot of talented players that can't get in the system. So that's important to know that you're still one of the best players in the entire world. And it's still like challenging and something that you said, which is really interesting. And this happened to me and this happens to everyone. Everyone like changes their career uh, throughout. Some go in similar areas, some go in completely different areas. And as I'm nearing in my thirties and you probably ended your career around when you were 30, you probably felt like life was starting over again because you've done this one thing and that can be, I know a lot of athletes go through depression, especially when you go through a system like that, where there's, so many systems in place for you to succeed or just go about your life. And then you come in or you leave and there's nothing there. And that can be really hard because you can feel like you're fallen backwards or you've wasted your time, which I know you haven't. How did you kind of get out of that? Cause that, that a lot of people I spoke to that they might never have a job like that again and they can't get over that. And I understand why. Mm-hmm. It was the help of therapy for sure. So like going to see a psychologist, writing about it certainly helped. Um, But a lot of it was in the same way that the only way to get over a breakup is with time. It largely was time, right? Of building some new scaffolding into my life and figuring out like, what what did I really care about? I did a fair bit of like trying to catch up socially. I mean, I... My life, and you know, Chris could speak to this, when you are so beholden to just going wherever the next team will take you, it doesn't really help you cultivate long-lasting relationships. You get really good at building new friendships, right? Chris and I actually only played together in Russia for like two months, but we, came, we became fast friends uh, nice. very quickly because I think we both had learned how to like quickly figure out like what's this person like? Um, but you know, if you're constantly uprooting your life, it's hard to build those long lasting relationships that most people have built by the time they're 32 or 33, which was when I stopped playing. So I had to spend some time, honestly, just like building relationships, going to, going to concerts and traveling and dating Um, for, for real for the first time. I mean, I had I'd had a couple of girlfriends while I played, but um, not a lot of serious relationships. And so I had to like really figure out like, how do I talk to people as a non-basketball player? How do I frame this experience that I've had? Uh, Which at that time, another thing that we forget is that it's not like, yes, I was a pro from, from post college to 33, but in a lot of ways I basically behaved like a pro from age 16 to 33. Right. Because, you know, in the summers when I was 16, 17, I was playing 80, 90, 100 basketball games in the summer 
And I was basically treating my life like a professional athlete would treat their lives. It was a constant like thought of well, where does this take me from a basketball standpoint? So, and then in co- I mean, college, college basketball here is in some ways like more professional than professional basketball, yeah, yeah. Uh, at least in lots of the places I ended up. Right. So, um, so it had, it, it had consumed. And even now, of the 44 years I've been alive, 17 of those were spent basically being a professional basketball player, even though only nine or 10 of them were technically as a pro. Um, you, have to, you have to start kind of thinking in that, those terms pretty early. And then if you really think about it, I probably didn't really come down from it till I was 35. So you could make the case that it was, it's still basically half my life was as a professional athlete. That's also interesting. And you alluded to this start in terms of the sense of self. Because if you're constantly joining a different team or in your environment or even just to travel, you have to fit in very quickly. You can almost be like a chameleon and not necessarily show your true self because you don't, you've got limits of time. You need to fit in. You need to make friends. You don't have family and support structures. So I would imagine right. as well that I know writing would help bring you to your true self, that you would have probably felt that you were losing part of yourself just to fit in or just to be in this system. So that, yeah. that as well would be hard, plus the identity of basketball as well. I actually remember so vividly in Russia at that point, it was, I think my fourth year as a pro, but I'd already played for 10 teams or something. And I was kind of losing sight of who I was, which was exacerbated by being in Russia, which is a very surreal place in general, especially as a Westerner. It just doesn't make sense in a lot of ways. The the way they are just, is kind of almost Kafka-esque to us. It just doesn't track. So I can remember coming home from practice one time and seeing myself in the mirror in the elevator. And because I had been through such a tumult in the last, the previous four years, it was like a complete relief to see my own reflection. Cause I was like, Oh yes, I know that guy. Like I, I can see, that I'm still here and that I exist because like you're saying, I had traveled around so much. And then even in the context of being on a team, you're now then traveling within being on a team, right? Like you're okay. Well, yes, I've arrived in Kazan, Russia, but we don't play all our games there. Right. Some of them are in Macedonia or Turkey or Samara, Russia or Vladivostok or whatever. So you do start to just like lose sight of who you are with the addition of, you're a part of a team. You're not an individual player. So you have to subsume some of your ego in order to fit in. Like that was, that was one of the things I was actually good at. And one of the things that was hard to explain to people was it's not like I'm just worried about going and showing up and being a good basketball player. I'm also analyzing how do I fit into this circumstance in the same way that you would have starting any new job, but in a much more exposed way, because you're, around a bunch of dudes who don't care about like you having a bad day because you got to perform immediately. Right. It's very interesting how humans learn is that you have to go through like huge hardships typically at the start before we actually Mm -hmm. learn. So going through all of that, yes, there's so many positives, but you kind of, the process of redefining who you are or rediscovering who you are, although it's very tricky and you have to do a lot of work and you continue to do a lot of work. That's also kind of exciting because I know I've had to do that and all my guests indirectly have spoken about it or directly. Do you see it that way? Like you've gone through all of this and now you've had the opportunity to, and look, you probably don't feel like that all the time and that's just the nature of the world, but was it still an exciting process to rediscover you? It's, it has given me a quiet confidence when I move through the world which is really helpful. Just that sense of uh, I've definitely been through harder situations. So this awesome happy hour is not going to be a big deal. Um, (laughs) I think that's one thing that like the last couple of years have really uh, dampened people's social skills, I would say. And I would say that having to try to figure out how to fit in, in so many weird situations has definitely made me more able to just deal with weird 
situations, which is a great skill to have, right? Oh, like if I'm best. today, I was today, I was talking to, you know, I was pitching some uh, apartment complex on maybe coming there to do a seminar and what we do at the process. And midway through it, I was like, you know, this is kind of a, this is kind of a real business meeting, but it, I don't really look at them like it that way. You know, I, it's just, well, I'm going to talk to these people, figure out what makes them tick. And then we'll figure out together if there's a way forward here. It doesn't, it doesn't feel like something that you would need an MBA to train for, you know? Well, it's the experience that you're talking about, the life that's why like getting out the house, which I haven't been doing lately just because of laziness, but previously getting out and experiencing and try different things. I'm now back at improv to get into that mindset. And that's where you, you, Oh, I'm preaching, but I don't care. That's where you discover like the beauty of life. And I've just been a hermit crab writing and doing podcasts, but going out and experiencing Mm. develops everything. And it takes away from which everyone has like degrees of like social anxiety or being in our head or just being present and grounded. Oh, the best skill. And I'm bringing that back. So I'm so happy that you bring that up as well. I'm glad you're yes. Anding at improv. Uh, Have you done improv before? Uh, I lived in LA for 10 years. So I, was around improv people. I'm so sorry. (laughs) (laughs) There's nothing worth, you pretty much have done improv if you live with improv people. Yeah, if you've you've just like dealt with improv people at a bar, you've done improv. Yep. So (laughs) I'd still recommend it to everyone, but don't be that person. I have a few more points and I know that we've talked about this, but I, I still think it's important. How did you deal with kind of maybe the pessimism of, you know, you're being cut and then moving to different teams Plus the travel, you know, we mentioned the paycheck, not knowing anyone. Did you have coping mechanisms or was it onto the next one? A lot of uh, really heavy rock music. Ooh. <laughs> Go on. Not my cup uh, of tea, but. But I, well, I think it was, um, that's another, like, that's another benefit to sports and its ability to teach us how to deal with failure, which we have now in this podcast decided we'll just call iteration. Um, I, I think I mentioned this in, uh, in the process is the product, this idea of um, letting yourself sit with the failure and come back from it. So like the wallowing stage is really valuable. Um, and I got really good at wallowing because like a loss of a game teaches you how to be sad. I mean, missing a shot might teach you how to be sad. A bad practice teaches you how to be sad. And so getting cut is just a larger version of that. And so I think I, without being taught it, just kind of figured out that I was going to need to like really immerse myself in this simmering of sadness and just like listen to a bunch of death tones and, uh, and feel sorry for myself for a while. And then once that was kind of flushed from my body, I was usually able the next day to pick myself up and move on. But, but I don't think that's possible without the training of just losing games and being sad or, or hurting yourself and being sad or whatever the thing might be. I think we now tend to try to shortcut to the picking yourself up and we forget that like, it's okay to just sit there and say, well, this sucks. I feel bad. I, I still struggle with that now because the losses aren't as clear. And I think that's the one thing that most people don't get from when they're not in sports is that the losses are a lot more vague. You know, somebody didn't write you back about some idea you pitched to them. Well, they didn't necessarily say no, they just haven't written back. So you're like, well, am I waiting for them still? Or is this truly a loss yet? I don't know. Um, there are very, there aren't as many clear rejections like there are in sports. It's also very interesting and actors have a really good take on this, but what I'm hearing is you have to feel it to heal it, not just go, okay, everything's going to move on. Cause then you're sweeping it under the carpet. The most mm-hmm. common example is let's just say you're dating someone and you've been dating them for a while and you've got all of this like pain and hurt. And then you go on to the next one. You haven't actually processed it and you're going to bring that baggage into the next one. And so what's really right. interesting with what you're saying with basketball is a defined time. We had a loss. I have to pick myself up by the next day. I've given myself this certain amount of time to feel it. And then that helps you obviously move forward because you're at least going through a process. 
And actors, I've heard many different like trains of thought, but some might give themselves, if they don't get a job, for example, or the audition doesn't go well, they give themselves an hour or 24 hours. They do whatever they want. I'm not saying like drugs and like partying and all of that stuff. Mm. And look, if that's your process, maybe uh, look at another one, but they have a process of I've, dedicating myself a certain amount of time to deal with it because otherwise it just keeps on coming up and it and you can have like breakdowns and it's very hard but allowing yourself time to feel it and heal it oh nice reminder to me as well glad to be of service <laughs> so i've written like fifty thousand points so let's see how we can go oh actually another thing which Another thing which I found really crushing is that you actually had developed a pilot of your experiences being like in commas, the 12th man on, on an NBA team and it never got made. My, I wouldn't say dream because it's now a goal. I know I can do it. You create something and then it doesn't go ahead. That would destroy me. I don't know how, tell me about that because that is, oh, yeah. Just tell me about well, that whole experience. The good news is that we did make the pilot. It just never got seen on air. So we spent three and a half million of Fox's dollars Casual. making a 22 minute pilot that was never on TV. And by the end of it, I think it was like a uh, relationship that gets so sour that you're not, by the end of it, you're not actually that despondent that it has ended because it started off with big dreams, right? I had, um, signed a book deal for my first book and in the, that process got a literary agent and the literary agent was at an agency that had a TV arm. And he said, why don't you talk to the TV people? And the TV person said, how about an idea for a TV show? And I said, what about wisecracking NBA 12th man? And they were like, let's go sell that. So we pitched to Fox and they gave us to go ahead to write the pilot. And, um, and then Dan Fogelman, who is actually a fairly well-known screenwriter now he's written like he wrote cars the movie and he writes for this is us and he wrote crazy stupid love wow um he wrote the pilot and then we went off and got to go ahead to make the pilot um but as it progressed it got less and less funny and less and less fun to make so by the end i was not stunned that it didn't get picked up um because we had really departed from kind of my original vision. I was actually just the other day or just recently, I've been watching, we're going to nerd out on screenwriting here. I've been watching Arrested Development, the oh, old that TV is show. The great, uh, I don't know why and that is not seen as one of the greatest shows. The writing is phenomenal and the layers of jokes. So yeah, chock-a-block with jokes. And I had been watching that a lot when I was in Russia. I was also a big fan of Scrubs, which is another TV show that's a little sillier. I love it. And so when we pitched the TV show, this show, our show, I said, I want to make something that's like Arrested Development where it's like super sarcastic, kind of meets Scrubs that just like makes fun of professional sports and like shows how it's not nearly as glamorous as it's supposed to be. And they were like, yes, we love that. Because it was also Fox, which had made it Arrested Development, right? They were that was the network for Arrested Development. It was one of their few hits. But as the show progressed, it just got sillier and sillier and less like hard funny, less like dry funny and more like kind of goofy funny. And I remember so well that I think I knew this was the point where it was going awry. They had built a set for the team plane which was completely unnecessary because we're only going to use it for a couple of shots, but they had built out an entire like interior of a team plane and they came to me and they're like, okay, so Paul, where would the bar go on the team plane? And I was like, guys, there's no bar on the team plane. <laughs> the whole point is that it's, you get on the plane and you're tired and you don't know which city you're going to next. And it sucks, right? Like that's, what's funny about it is that it's the opposite of what people think. And they're like, Right, but what if we had hot girls as like bartenders at the oh, bar on the team plane? And I was like, oh, you guys don't understand. Like you're, this is the problem is you want it to be like your vision of professional sports. And I want to tell the story of how it's not like that. And that is a real impasse. And sure enough, that's where I think we lost sight of the ball was they wanted to glamorize the life and I wanted to de-glamorize it. And that caused problems. 
there's no okay we're doing a part two because we can just talk about that for ages but there's no way it would yeah. succeed if you're on two different pages because their story is so unrealistic as well and yours is hilarious because it shows line that's where the humor is i can already see it i know that mm. you would have been told you can never do it but is it possible that with time you can now try and show that again because it's a really good idea um i don't know i think um i think australians and and people from the UK and, and New Zealanders would like that sense of humor, but Americans, I don't know if they want their sports lampooned. In some ways, those executives were right that like the average viewer doesn't want to think of sports as uh, grounds for laughing because the same network that's showing that TV show is also showing American football and people need to take that very seriously. They want to believe that the guys out there like care all the time oh, yeah. about whether the Baltimore Ravens win the game. And I, I want to think about like, well, yeah, but what if that guy just broke up with his girlfriend before the game? How's he going to play? Does he care about the game? Does he even remember which team he plays for? Like that's the stuff that's funny to me, but that's not necessarily funny to the average viewer of Fox, you know? We'll talk off air, but I reckon you could pitch that to a UK network. So okay, keep, keep an open we'll mind. Just... I reckon we'll do a very quick rapid fire segment to wrap up the podcast. I've written down a hundred okay. points. So we'll see if anything can go here. How do you define the flow state when you're writing? It is that I am surprised when 30 minutes has gone by. Ooh. Why did you want to punch Kobe Bryant? Because <laughs> he was so mean to me. And it seemed unnecessary because I was in no way threatening to his status on the team. And it, it tripped my alarms for there's something not right here. <laughs> and not the, I won't speak ill of the dead, which I never quite understood that saying because you can't speak badly about Hitler. But anyway, I'm, <laughs> that's a topic for another time. What makes a good leader? Oh, that's a good question because I think it's something that people talk about a lot these days. I would say I had a couple of college coaches that one who I'm close with, one who I'm not close with. Is that Tim Floyd? Tim Floyd that I'm very close with. Larry Eustachy that I'm not very close with. But Eustachy did say something profound once, which was that to be a good coach, you have to be the most yourself that is possible. Like you cannot pretend to be someone else. So like Larry Stacey could not try to coach like Bob Knight, could not try to coach like Mike Krzyzewski, could not coach like whoever else. And I think that's true of leadership in that you have to be the most yourself as is possible in order to have any chance. Now, people may not want to follow around that version of a human, <laughs> yeah. but, but it's, it's not possible to try to pretend, it's not possible to read up on how to be a leader, but it might be possible to be as self-actualized as can be, and that that is the way forward. Like whatever your strategy is, is has to be really dialed in and, it, and you're just not going to be able to be somebody else as a leader. I can't be Lee Iacocca or Steve Jobs or whoever else, right? I have to be the most me that is possible. And I won't comment on these, but that's also the same with an actor. If you want to be, if you want to emulate someone a hundred percent, that person's going to get all the roles and not you. And very loaded statement. I think that's kind of the key to one success is being as true, the best versions of ourselves. So that's how we can succeed. Um, you, I also heard you say, which is really interesting that the best leaders have empathy and I'm surprised that some of the leaders or coaches you've had lack that, but I guess there are people out there as well. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, we forget that the world needs a lot of basketball coaches. So there's going to be some suboptimal ones out there also. <laughs> That's a polite way of saying it. What keeps you creative? Um, I think it's connection. It's that sense of, of, uh, of consuming things that make me feel more connected to whoever created it and wanting to do that for someone else, right? So if I read a book 
or even a magazine article or see something on TV and it, and it makes me feel less alone, then I remember that there's a chance that I will be able to do that for somebody else. Ooh, I like that. What are you most proud of? Mm, most proud of. So I have in my bedroom, I have my Iowa State jersey and my mechanical engineering di- diploma next to each other. And so you would think like I would probably have like my Phoenix Suns jersey or, or something like that. I go like for that. Suns. But, I'm surprised. <laughs> but to me, that was the most formative and difficult thing I accomplished was the two things at once, right? Being able to get an engineering degree and play this really high level of basketball. So one without the other is not necessarily my greatest accomplishment, but being able to manage the two and having that also be something that had scared me previously. I was as homesick as someone could be for my first year at Iowa State. I was as overwhelmed as someone could be for my first year at Iowa State. So it was, this is me overcoming a lot of the fears that I had about going off to college, which most people, you know, most people are like, oh, I loved going off to college because it was freedom. But for me, it was like going to the military. It was terrifying. I was really going to be in over my head. So I think that like if you if you offered me ten million dollars to go back and be seventeen again, I would not take it because I wouldn't want to have to go through all of that learning again. Yeah, so it, so it feels like that that just that sense of being able to manage both of those is the thing that I'm proud of. Even though I would love to have come up with a more conceptual answer, like no, I think that's brilliant. Them. But also, it's not like a it's nice that you see there's moments I look back in my life and I'm like, I'm so proud of it, but I'd never do it again. I wouldn't change it, but there's no way I would do it again. So yeah, I think that yeah. is, it's very empowering. Okay. Last mm-hmm. few. Would you ever consider getting a Lake, Lakers jersey with your surname on it? <laughs> I should, uh, that would be like a, an amazing gag gift for somebody to get me someday. I hope your friends are listening. Yeah. Um, Best teammate. Best teammate, Chris Anstey. No, uh, I mean, Chris Anstey was, was a great teammate. Um, but uh, we, we really only played like, I don't know, probably three games together because he had appendicitis when, he, when I got to Russia and then I left because it sucked. Um, <laughs> best, best teammate. Um, man, I've had so many teammates. Uh, and so therefore it is... Difficult. Or what makes a good teammate if you can't think of the one? So, like, and this will be, this is, like, kind of, it's, it's hard because so many of my teammates I would only have for such a short time. But to me, uh, Kevin Garnett was the most impressive teammate, not just necessarily to me, because I was only in training camp with the Minnesota Timberwolves for three weeks or something. But the degree to which he cared and also the amount that he would stick up for his teammates seemed on a different level and was very heartening. It was kind of like what I, if I had just been better, that's what I would have liked to have been was like that level of good. And also that level of loyal to the people around me. Your passion is very passionate guy. Mm Mm-hmm. What is your next big dream or goal? Hmm. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's a sense of peace is my next big dream or goal. I had a real sense of peace toward the end of my basketball career because I knew how good I was within the context of basketball. And that's a very freeing feeling to know, okay, here's where I am. Here's where some people are better than I am at this. And some people are not as good, but I'm going to make a living at this and I'm going to keep getting better. And I am still fighting for that sense of peace. I felt very close to it when I was in Los Angeles and I was writing books and I was running this writing space and then COVID kind of killed that. And so we have pivoted to this other business that I'm doing, which as I mentioned, I think has a lot of 
potential for success and, and there are signs that what we're doing is right, but I'm not at a place yet where I feel like I can kind of like let go and feel that sense of peace. Is there any advice you want to give young people who want to try something different on you, but perhaps a bit fearful of doing so? It would be to, tr instead of trying that one thing, sort of like we talked about earlier, trying three things and realizing that trying one thing is actually kind of a recipe for disaster because there's a pretty good chance you won't be good at it. But if you try three things or five things or nine things, you'll find one of those things that you're good at. Amazing. Before we go and we ask how people can follow you and check out all the cool things that you're doing, what is the one question I should have asked you? Um, man. Uh, you should have asked me. Uh, I'm, I'm desperately wanting to play along. Um, you should have asked me to describe the room I'm in because that would have given you some context. Okay, please tell me. Um, I feel like my, so I, I downsized when I moved from Los Angeles to Denver and I really love my, I'm actually at my apartment now and I love that I've got like my records over there. I have, I've actually recently gotten back into listening to CDs um, Ooh, that's cool. because I'm, I'm realizing that we consume music in a kind of disposable way, which I mean, that's not like everybody's had that realization. But I also realized that like build, rebuilding my rec, my collection in just vinyl would be too expensive. So I'm like loving getting to try out old CDs that I haven't seen in ages and ages. Um, and then I have a few books, but not nearly as many as I had in LA and a piece of art that I bought in Chile and an old 1950s map of Europe. Oh, and yeah. it's a very, it's a very uh, calming environment, which I'm, and it, uh, I love, I just, I just enjoy that I've like downsized in this way and I'm happy about it. I've also downsized massively. I was staying with my parents a little while ago and they had pretty much a mansion. I am not even remotely close to mansion, but creating a space that you really like is the best feeling in the world. So kudos mm -hmm. to you. Before we go, how can people follow you, buy your books? Is writer's block still happening or how can people get involved with that or any other? And tell us what it is. And oh, yeah. so writer's, writer's block is dead. Um, the, the thing I run now is called The Process. The process. And it is, um, yeah, we actually, interestingly, we have a couple of uh, members who are in Australia. So it's uh, what I would say is it's virtual co-working and goal management. So we do a fair bit of like productivity coaching, but at the core of it is these virtual deep work sessions where people log in from wherever they are in the world set a goal for the 45 minutes of working that starts like at a set time. They all started on the hour and then people will like, your goal might be, I'm going to write three pages of a screenplay and somebody else's might be, I have to debug this computer program I'm working on. And somebody else's is like, I got to do three pages of this pitch deck. And then after 45 minutes, you all come back to the channel and kind of chat about like what actually got accomplished. But in, we also then have people set goals for the quarter or goals for the month goals goals for the day, goals for the week, just helping people like build a process for these kind of ephemeral big projects they're working on. So if people are interested in that, uh, the website is createyourprocess.com. And um, if you would like to pay attention to what I'm doing, uh, Twitter's a pretty good way. Uh, my handle is at Paul Ben Shirley. And your books? Books, go to Amazon, buy them up. I feel like if you're in, I was, I was at a book signing recently um, where, where I was mostly talking about the process as the product, which is my most recent one, which is nonfiction, of course. Um, but a family came over and it was really fun to be able to be like, okay, so for your 11 year old son, he should read Ball Boy, which is my novel about like a kid finding basketball as a way to fit in in a small town. Okay, for your teenage daughter, she should read Stories I Tell on Dates, which is my second book, which is nonfiction, Stories I Tell on Dates. Okay, for the dad, you should take Can I Keep My Jersey? And for the mom, you should read Keep The Process as the Product. So it was like, I don't know, it was very fun to have that moment where like I had something for everybody. I think that's awesome. That's a huge credit to you. I've been reading Can I Keep My Jersey? It's fantastic. You've got a unique tone and you can really feel the personality. It's very entertaining. I highly recommend it. Everything you've said will be in the episode notes so people can check it out. 
I really appreciate your time. Thank you for going over. You're a legend and I've learned heaps. Thanks, man. It's kind of you to say. Thanks for the thoughtful questions and the in-depth research. You can see why Paul is an expert on discovering one's best process to achieve success. I love Paul's take on the process. That is the journey towards the achievement of or non-achievement of a goal. It can be very easy to be focused on the end goal. However, Paul explains that the learning and the fun is in the actual doing. One won't be able to reap the rewards of the success if you can't enjoy the work itself. He passionately explains that we have to fall in love with the process so that we can find meaning within the project and grow and learn from it. This will ultimately lead to a more holistic view and all-rounded view of success. So I'll leave you with this epic quote by Mandy Hale. Trust the weight. Embrace the uncertainty. Enjoy the beauty of becoming. When nothing is certain, anything is possible. Thank you for listening to the Funny and Failure podcast, exploring the deeper side of comedy. (laughs) 